Hello and welcome back to another video. My name is CJ the Populist New Yorker and today we're going to be looking at the 2022 uh, gubernatorial elections. So oftentimes the spotlight tends to be on the Senate races and House races for the midterms but almost just as important are of course the governor's races. 36 states will be electing new governors next year and these races are very important for a number of reasons. They set how uh, policies are going to be implemented in the various states for the next four years and also how federal policies are going to be worked down into the state. So we're going to start from right to left or west to east with the state of Oregon. So Oregon currently has a Democratic governor, Kate Brown. Uh, she is term limited so she can no longer run for re-election but uh, the states of Washington and Oregon tend to have fairly close gubernatorial elections, usually within uh, mid to high single digits in favor of the Democrats. I believe Oregon hasn't had a uh, Republican governor in around 36 years, similar to Washington. Uh, of course, the presidential election is uh, a little bit more polarized in Oregon. Uh, it tends to go plus 16 in favor of the Democrats. That's how it went for Joe Biden. Trump only lost the state by I believe 11 points back in 2016 but of course a lot of that can be attributed to the third party vote which heavily um, seemed to favor him in terms of Hillary Clinton at least in Oregon as a lot of the third party vote was going to candidates like Bernie and such. Even in red midterms years the state of Oregon doesn't seem to be too crazy competitive if we go down to Oregon's page. Uh, some of the contenders for the top office are of course uh, Bud Pierce. He was the gubernatorial nominee back in 2016 during their special governor's election. The governor's races tend to be a lot closer in the state of Oregon. Um, Bud Pierce only lost by around seven points to Kate Brown and improved a lot in uh, the swingy areas of the state like Salem, uh, Clackamas County. These areas that tend to be only light red he kind of solidified. Uh, if we just go up, of course, um, you know, Donald Trump only lost the state by 11. He did a lot worse in these counties uh, compared to Bud Pierce. He did lose in 2016. However, this is going to be a midterm year, a slightly different dynamic. Uh, his opponent on the Democratic side is likely to be uh, Portland Mayor Ted Wheeler or possibly Tobias Reed, who is the Oregon State Treasurer. Um, I think for right now, since we're so far out with this race, we're probably going to rank it as a lean Democrat, considering the margins tend to be close in the state of Oregon. It'll probably be moved up to likely as we get more polling and know about the nominee. Uh, California, we're not going to talk too much about, uh, you know, the whole recall effort with Gavin Newsom uh, won't really change a whole lot because in 2022, uh, it's almost certain that a Democrat is going to win this seat, even uh, in an off-year election. I mean, if we look back at 2018, uh, Gavin Newsom won over uh, the Republican by around 23, 24 points. So um, it's a pretty lopsided state in favor of the Democrats. Um, all the population uh, areas are so heavily in favor of the Democrats that it's really not any uh, governor's race that's going to be in contention. Uh, the state of Idaho is probably going to be safe red. Uh, just as it is on the presidential level, uh, Idaho is usually red on the state level as well. Brad Little's probably going to run for re-election. He ended up winning over his Democratic opponent by 21 points during a blue year. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he wins by around 25 or so. So the state of Idaho is going to be safe for the Republicans. Uh, Nevada is kind of interesting because Steve Sisolak is not really in a strong position for his re-election. Uh, he only won by around four points in 2018, uh, which was a red year. Nevada is one of those strange states that no matter... Uh, you know, besides 28, uh, 2008, no matter how strong the blue or red wave is, doesn't really seem to hit Nevada all too much. Um, especially nowadays, um, you know, Nevada has been close both presidentially and during the midterms. If you look at 2020, Nevada was the only Clinton state to get red, albeit I think it was like 0.1%. But uh, the fact that a lot of the Clinton states went from margins of two to three points, you know, a state like Maine ends up going nine to Biden, a state like Minnesota ends up going seven to Biden. There certainly is something to be said that the state of Nevada actually trended red overall as a state, as opposed to um, the rest of the other Clinton states. Um, also, uh, Steve Sisolak does not really have a high approval right now. Um, if Adam Laxlett does run, who is the former uh, attorney general and actually his opponent in the last race he seems to be the strongest candidate but I think 
for now we're going to rank this as tilt democrat since again we have nearly two years before this race actually happens uh the state of arizona is really interesting because doug ducey the incumbent governor um is fairly popular but he is term limited he's also sparred with the trump administration considerably and donald trump does not like him very much so any hopes of him running for the senate seat against mark kelly and probably winning because he would definitely uh, I wouldn't say definitely, but there's a high chance that if he did run against Mark Kelly, he would win. Uh, Arizona is a purple state, but they tend to like uh, their Republican incumbents. I mean, Doug Ducey uh, destroyed a, a progressive challenger, David Garcia, the Democrat, by 15 points just about. Um, the same year, of course, that Kirsten Sinema won her Senate race by 2.4%. So Arizona is the type of state that will split ticket. For certain Republicans, Doug Ducey especially, even despite the COVID handling, he's very popular in Arizona. Um, but I think for right now, this race being a toss-up, uh, see, this is where it gets interesting because the Arizona GOP tends to nominate very Trump Republicans to its uh, statewide offices or nominates them to run. And they usually – now they seem to lose. You know, Martha McSally lost twice. Um, and, of course, Trump even lost the state of Arizona in 2020. Uh, but I think this state is still uh, a tilt Republican state overall. I think just because we don't really have any solid opponents. I, I know they think there is one uh, very pro-Trump guy running in the state. If he ends up becoming the nominee, I might change the ranking. But I think for right now, there's a slight edge for Republicans in the state of Georgia. Uh, I mean Arizona. We'll get to Georgia later. Uh, Alaska is probably going to be lean Republican. And the reason I don't move this any higher, right? Oh, there we go, lean. Uh, the reason I don't move that any higher, of course, is because uh, the current governor, Mike Dunleavy, is actually fairly unpopular. And in fact, there's efforts to recall him uh, because of his cutting of state funds and their kind of state UBI. Um, he won a first term by around six points, which is a, a much smaller margin for a state like Alaska. Alaska is a safe Republican state, but it doesn't tend to go as solidly to the GOP as, you know, a state like Alabama or Tennessee or Arkansas does. Um, it is definitely a lot different. So I think this race has the potential to be sort of close, although I don't expect it to be too close. Uh, Wyoming is going to be safe red. Uh, Colorado is probably going to go to Polis, either by a safe margin or a likely margin. Uh, again, Polis was, Polis was elected by 11 points in the 2018 midterms over um, Walker Stapleton. He wasn't even an incumbent. So I tend to actually say that this is probably going to be a safe Democratic seat. I don't really see Colorado trending red uh, anytime soon. Uh, and, of course, we have Joe Biden, who won the state by over 13 percentage points. Uh, you know, this was a state that was once Republican. This was a state that voted for Bush both times. Uh, you know, Romney only lost the state by five, and Trump ended up losing it by 13. In fact, Trump only lost it by five in 2016. So, I mean, if we just look at the shifts from uh, – you know, 2012, I mean, 2016, massive, massive shifts towards the left. And I think that's going to reverberate statewide. They ousted uh, incumbent Republican Senator Cory uh, Gardner by nine points. So I think Jared Polis is going to have no problem running for reelection. Uh, same with the state of New Mexico. Michelle Lujan Grissom is going to win pretty comfortably. Uh, she won by nearly 15 points in 2018. Um, uh, New Mexico tends to be pretty friendly to its incumbent candidates, especially if they're Democrats, uh, particularly if they're Democrats, which most of them are now. Um, I think she's probably going to win maybe by a smaller margin, but I think she's going to have no problem winning this seat by uh, 12 points or more. So that's going to be a safe seat. Uh, South Dakota could get very interesting um, because a lot of the polling agencies um, – which, again, polls are not really to be trusted very much, especially after the past two general elections. But they all have this race as uh, safe Republican. I will put a caveat, though, if Billy Sutton is the Democrat. He's a very interesting uh, progressive pro-gun Democrat, uh, Bernie Sanders type. And, uh, of course, um, the Bernie Sanders types Democrats tend to do better out west. Um, if we look at 2018, um, we go back to South Dakota's governor's race. Uh, he only lost by around three points, less than three points, really, if you do the math. Uh, well, a little bit more, actually. But for a state like South Dakota, this is a very, very close uh, election. Christy Nome uh, really didn't seem to be that popular from the get-go. And um, I think the only thing that will save her, her re-election, is that she's become a very nat national Republican figure. So even though she's not a very popular governor, 
I think overall this is probably going to go to her by a likely margin. I don't really see it as safe yet, uh, just because I'd need to see more polling and who her opponent is and stuff. But right now she's not a very popular governor. Uh, but again, she does have that star national status, so I think that's really going to help her. Uh, the state of Nebraska, I don't really think is going to be uh, up for grabs. Uh, Peter Ricketts, the incumbent in 2018, won by 18 points. Um, of course, we look at the rankings for the state of Nebraska. I bet they're all safe Republican. And I'm just curious to see what kind of candidates uh, are actually running. Um, so there is a, a former Republican who ran in 2014, lost the primary. Don Bacon might end up running for governor. That would be pretty interesting because that would put that um, that House seat uh, up for grabs, sort of. But this is definitely going to be a safe Republican seat, no matter who wins, even if it's a more Trump Republican, whatnot. Uh, which I think those are going to start to, to, I guess, die down in the sense that and I'll probably make a video on the GOP uh, party split um, later on because I don't really think they're going to split into separate parties. But you will see two I ideological factions, the more uh, center right and the more, uh, you know, paleo conservative nationalist wing of the party uh, really come to a head. And I think in, in some safe red states, that not, that's not really going to matter. But in the swing states that Biden ended up winning, that's probably not the best strategy to run a, a super pro-Trump candidate. Uh, Kansas is interesting because Kansas has a an incumbent Democratic governor. Uh, it's a very, very red state, uh, even though it's been trending blue. Um, but Laura Kelly won by five points over Chris Kobach. Now, keep in mind, this was after the backlash uh, from the Sam uh, Brownback administration, which was abysmal in terms of what it did to the state, destroyed the economy. A very unpopular governor. Uh, Laura Kelly won pretty comfortably for a uh, Democratic incumbent. If you look at the 2020 election, uh, of course, uh, Kansas went to – did I say Nebraska? I meant Kansas if I did. Um, Kansas went to Donald Trump by around 14 points, 15 points. Uh, so a pretty safe state. However, on the governor's level, uh, it's a little bit more contentious um, as we saw in 2018. Now, I'm just curious who is running – uh, in Kansas, because a lot of these candidates are very speculative. They're not uh, set in stone. Uh, of course, Laura Kelly is probably going to run. She is running. Uh, and we have uh, Jeff Collier, or Collier, who is a former, the former governor of Kansas. I guess he was the lieutenant governor after Sam Brownback resigned or was chosen. I forget what actually happened to him. Uh, so I think this, this seat overall is going to be uh, pretty contentious. And the reason I say that is because of how red the state of Nebraska actually is. You know, it's a very, very red state. But I think with these kind of leanings, I would give a slight edge, um, you know, to the Republicans. Uh, again, Kelly is actually somewhat popular, but again, that might not be enough to save her. Again, David Perdue had a net uh, positive favorability in Georgia, and he was voted out. Uh, same with Kelly Ayotte in 2016. Of course, those are senators, but... Uh, you know, when you're in a state as red as Kansas, it really is an uphill battle. Even if you're a popular Democratic governor, and she's not that popular, but she's above water, to actually hold on to that seat. Uh, Oklahoma is going to be safe red. Um, Kevin Stitt had a bit of a problem in 2018. He only won his seat by 12, uh, which is a convincing margin in any other swing state. But in a state like Oklahoma, which is a safe Republican state, um, it's not too much. But his approval rating is uh, above water. He's at 52%. I think his disapproval is in the mid to high 30s, but that's definitely manageable in a state like Oklahoma. I don't think he'll have a problem winning re-election. Uh, Greg Abbott um, won re-election very convincingly in 2018 by around 13 points um, during a blue wave year. In fact, I think he was the best performing Republican in the midterms in Texas. A lot of down-ballot Republicans really got hurt uh, during the election, but Greg Abbott wasn't really touched by that. He won pretty convincingly, and you know the voters in Texas do seem to like him. Uh, even despite lifting all the lockdown orders, a lot of people outside the state think that's going to be uh, a very unpopular decision. But in Texas, um, I don't really think it's going to hurt him very much. Um, you know, I would put this as a safe seat um, because Greg Abbott is a very popular. Um, Republican, but I'd still want to see who his challenger would be. So I'm going to put it as a likely Republican, but I don't really think there's a realistic chance of Democrats uh, capturing the governor's mansion in Texas, at least during 2022. Uh, Hawaii is going to be safe blue. There's not too much to talk about there. 
Uh, Minnesota is probably going to be likely blue. Uh, Tim Walls is the incumbent uh, governor. Um, I haven't really heard too much about him. I don't think he's very unpopular. I mean, he won by around 11 points. He might win by a narrow margin this time around, given that it's going to be most likely a higher turnout for Republicans. But I would definitely say that's going to be comfortably in the Democratic's hand, uh, Democratic Party's hands. Uh, Governor Reynolds in Iowa is actually an interesting one because she's, I think, the most unpopular governor in the entire country. Now, she only won uh, her election by around three points um, in 2018, which I guess isn't too shocking because this was a you know blue wave year. This was a year where Democrats were really favored. Um, but uh, other statewide races uh, tended to be all over the place. So she had a slight advantage, of course. Uh, you know, the attorney general race went heavily, heavily in favor of the Democrat. In fact, uh, every county uh, essentially voted for him. He ran unopposed, which is crazy. Um, but something to note here, Iowa is still a state that splits, uh, splits its ticket down. And I think her being such an unpopular governor at the moment is a huge detriment to her. Um, I'm curious who else would be running against uh, her. She already has a primary challenger, which is very fascinating. Uh, Ashley Hinson, how long has she been in office? Oh, wow. So she's a freshman congressman trying to challenge her in the primary. I don't really think that's going to go anywhere. Um, but but again, uh, her potential uh, challengers uh, might pose a threat. I would probably put it as tilt red just because of her unpopularity. Now, that could very well change in the future, as I will be updating this prediction over time. So I expect that to change, actually. So I think it probably will move in one direction or the other. Uh, Arkansas is going to be safe red, most likely. Uh, Wisconsin is a really interesting one because Tony Evers, the incumbent governor, um, I think his approval rating is mediocre. Um, I don't think he's that unpopular, but he's also not that popular. Um, I just want to see um, who we have. So he has a slight advantage in the governor's race. However, there are a lot of people uh, trying to run uh, against him. Uh, I would kind of give the slight edge to possibly the Republicans. Uh, for some reason, they have Ron Johnson as a potential for governor. I think that would be kind of ridiculous. Uh, but there's a lot of people trying to challenge Tony Evers. And I think, uh, you know, this might be a bit of a surprising prediction, but I actually think I would give a slight edge uh, to his Republican challenger. And this might be the first Democratic uh, gubernatorial candidate uh, knocked off, I guess, besides uh, Laura Kelly. Uh, now, the reason for that is because the state of Wisconsin uh, actually voted to the right of the nation in 2020. Oh, I don't have 2020 up. In 2020, it was one of the closest states, 49.4 uh, to 48. So a 0.6% margin for Biden. That's a smaller margin than Trump's uh, in the state. I think overall, the state of Wisconsin has trended more Republican, even if Biden has won the state. Generally speaking, I mean, if you look at old political maps of Wisconsin, most of rural, the rural Wisconsin is actually blue. Um, and it was the wow counties, the, the suburban Milwaukee counties that were redder. Now, I definitely think in a scenario where there's lower turnout overall, higher Republican turnout, these wow counties are going to be more solidly red. And these, you know, rural turnout is going to be higher. So I think Tony Evers could have a decently tough time getting reelected, but it's definitely not impossible uh, J.B. Pritzker is probably going to be a safe margin in Illinois. Um, you know, his, his approval is mediocre. You know, he's sort of a corrupt guy, but every politician in Illinois is very corrupt. You know, that's where Chicago is. Republican and Democrat, they've all got scandals. Uh, but I think he won't have a problem running uh, again. Uh, Illinois tends to be one of those uh, states that sometimes can be close. You know, you can sometimes see lean margins in the governor's races, uh, even flips. I mean, uh, Bruce Rauner, the former governor of Illinois, was a Republican. Granted, he was a very moderate Republican, more like a Larry Hogan type, or even a Charlie Baker type, but I lean more towards a Larry Hogan type of Republican. But uh, this time around, him being the incumbent, him not having a uh, bad popularity, uh, the last Democratic opponent, uh, governor, I mean, to be knocked off was Pat Quinn, who was Bruce Rauner's opponent in 2014, and he had a ton of uh, corruption scandals and was a very unpopular governor. Uh, Kentucky, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee is going to be uh, a safe red seat. Same with Alabama. Uh, both governors are not going to have any problem being reelected. K. Ivy in the state of Alabama, and I believe in Tennessee, 
uh, yeah, Bill Lee, who is actually very popular as a governor. I believe he introduced a uh, some sort of free community college program for low-income uh, people in the state. So I, I imagine that's going to be pretty popular. Uh, Gretchen Whitmer, I actually think, is not going to have a problem winning a re-election in 2022. Um, you know, she's a big target for the right, uh, but inside the state, she's uh, fairly popular. Her approval rating is always above 50%. Her disapproval is always in the mid-30s. So I don't think, even with the red wave, I don't really think she's going to lose re-election. Again, if we look at how she was re-elected uh, in 2018... She won substantially. Uh, she won by around 10 points. Um, if for some reason in 2026, hypothetically, um, now a lot of these governor's races uh, tend to be a mixed bag for Republicans. This isn't like the red wave of 2014 or even 2010, at least not the way I'm seeing it right now. But in some scenario in 2024, if we have another Democratic president, whether it be Kamala Harris or some other, you know, somehow Joe Biden uh, stays around and runs again, um, I definitely think you could see more of a quote-unquote red wave because a lot of these Democratic governors, say Evers wins, say uh, Whitmer wins, Sisolak wins, they're going to be term limited and these are going to be open seats. That's where you have some real potential for Republicans. But again, that's way in the future. Uh, we don't really need to focus about that right now. Uh, Ohio is going to be a safe red seat. Um, that, of course, is implying that Mike DeWine will win his primary and run in the general. I think both of those things are going to happen. Uh, I think Mike DeWine's probably going to be challenged by, uh, you know, three or four people. In fact, let's go check because I wouldn't be surprised if there's three or four Republicans uh, that are challenging him in the primary. Um, and there are. There's at least one, and there's a bunch of potentials. Uh, so with that being said, I think DeWine is probably going to cruise to re-election in the primary. He'll probably get 60 or 70 percent. I lean towards 60 just because the Trump base is very angry with him. But I think in the general, he's going to win a sort of John Kasich margin. He's very popular governor. I think his approval is still uh, in the 60s, which is very high. So I think he's going to have no problem uh, winning that seat. Uh, I guess we'll go north and work our way down the coast. I think uh, Maine is probably going to be lean Democrat right now. Uh, it's implied that Janet Mills is going to run for re-election. She's going against Paul LePage. He's a former governor, and with ranked choice voting, uh, it very well could be a likely margin in favor of Janet Mills. But until I see uh, significant polling on it, I'm going to give her the edge, given that Maine is a Democratic state. Uh, these two, the New England in particular, is hard to predict because uh, if Sununu does run for Senate, uh, then that leaves the governorship open. But if he doesn't run for Senate, uh, that would give Republicans an advantage. Now, as of right now, it's early March 2021. Sununu has not announced he's running for Senate. I'm going to assume he's probably going to run for re-election. I would put it probably as a likely uh, in margin in favor of him, and I'd put uh, Phil Scott's margin as safe. Again, Phil Scott's margin uh, even amazes me. You know, Vermont's uh, the bluest state in the country now. It beat out Hawaii. And yet, with that being said, Biden winning the state by 36 points. Phil Scott uh, wins the state by 41 points. So he won a bigger margin than even Joe Biden did in the state of Vermont. So that goes to show you his popularity crosses all party lines. Uh, Massachusetts uh, is going to be safe Republican if Charlie Baker does run. And I think he will run given he is not term limited. Uh, so it's very possible. Of course, this is going to change if he doesn't run. And uh, some people are speculating that he's raising money for his lieutenant governor to take the reins, in which case I'd probably move it down to a lean. But the administration is very popular, and I don't really see that changing much. Uh, Connecticut and Rhode Island, as of right now, are going to be safe blue. I don't really know much about uh, you know, Ned Lamont. Ned Lamont's actually fairly popular. You know, Connecticut governor's races, you know, we can look at 2018 e even. Uh, Connecticut governor's races tend to get pretty close, uh, even during uh, blue years. Of course, that was uh, one of the reasons uh, Governor Malloy was so despised uh, by just everyone in the state that he almost lost in 2014. So he probably didn't bother to run for re-election. But, you know, it could get somewhat close here. Uh, same with uh, Rhode Island occasionally. Gina Raimondo is no longer governor. Daniel McKee is governor, and I think he'll have no problem running for re-election. Uh, my home state of New York, um, Cuomo will probably win by a safe margin, you know, unfortunately. Um, you know, uh, even if he, you know, he might face a primary challenge, uh, there's going to be a lot of noise to get him out of office, but I think the scandals uh, overtaking his administration right now are probably too early to have a, 
you know, reasonable political impact. And again, he's a Cuomo in New York. I think the only person that could beat Andrew Cuomo is uh, former Governor George Pataki. Again, we could look at the last time New York elected a Republican governor. Um, well, this isn't the last time, but um, if we go back to the last time New York elected a Republican governor, uh, we'd have to go back to 2002 when they reelected George Pataki by a pretty substantial margin. But of course, New York has changed a lot then. A lot of people in the red areas are actually moving out of the state. So if anything, New York is getting bluer. Um, at least it should be, with that being said. Um, but there are some shifts in New York City. But um, for now, I think Cuomo is going to cruise to re-election uh, in the general. Uh, Pennsylvania, uh, we don't really have many solid gubernatorial candidates. Um, I actually think the edge probably will go to the Republicans. And the reason I say that in Pennsylvania is because, um, especially if we have somebody like Fitzpatrick running, uh, but, you know, of course, in 2018, uh, Tom Wolf won uh, 17 points over his opponent. He destroyed his opponent. He's a very popular Democratic governor. But he's term limited and can't run again. Um, the last time uh, Pennsylvania had a Republican governor elected was in 2010. It was Tom Corbett. Of course, he ended up not being very popular. Of course, this map here definitely looks a lot different than uh, the 2018 map. Uh, most of suburban philadelphia is actually red minus montgomery and delaware county um so this is definitely a state that's up for grabs again this is a state in 2020 that uh actually voted out their incumbent democratic treasurer uh and they elected a republican state auditor so those are you know statewide offices that actually went red and i think the midterm will definitely produce probably a strong Republican candidate in Pennsylvania. Another reason I say that, too, is because Pennsylvania is one of those states uh, that tends to switch parties. Uh, so there'll be a Democrat in office for two terms, then a Republican, then another Democrat. And it's been that way, I think, nonstop since the 1960s. And minus Tor Tom Corbett losing his reelection, I think that trend is likely to continue. That just is the kind of state Pennsylvania is. Uh, so I think Pennsylvania is probably going to have a slight edge. Uh, for the Republicans. Uh, Maryland, I actually would give a slight edge to Republicans too. And the reason uh, I do that is because uh, Larry Hogan's lieutenant governor, I think, is actually running for governor. And uh, Larry Hogan is still a very popular governor. He won his reelection by around 13 points, uh, given that Maryland is one of the uh, reddest, uh, bluest states in the country. That is a pretty impressive feat. And I think also the former Republican. Uh, lieutenant governor from the uh, uh what was that guy's name the the last republican administration in uh maryland before larry hogan uh he's the lincoln project guy i'm blanking on his name right now uh but he's also running so that could be an interesting republican primary it seems the republicans actually have the stronger candidates this time around uh interestingly enough i actually think uh Tom Perez, the former DNC chair, is actually running for governor on the Democratic side. So I guess make of that what you will. But for now, I'd give the slight edge to Republicans, uh, given that these, of course, are not your Trump, nationalist, paleoconservative, or even, you know, conservative. I mean, except in the fiscal sense. Um, although I would say Larry Hogan's more of just a never Trump Republican. He is somewhat conservative on issues. It's just he can't really act on them. But these moderate Republicans, uh, probably have a, a better shot than the Democrats at this point, at least at, at this stage in the race. Uh, South Carolina is likely to be safe red. Uh, the governor's race here, Henry McMaster, um, sort of a tight margin here. He only won by around eight points. Um, I don't really know why this race ended up being so close, possibly the blue wave, but I don't really see South Carolina being this close again. Uh, especially since he's going to be the incumbent, he'll probably end up being reelected pretty comfortably. Uh, now we have the state of Georgia. This is a pretty shocking prediction, but I actually think this uh, is going to flip to the Democrats. Now, I think Georgia, uh, out of all the states, has been trending the most rapidly in favor of the Democratic Party. Uh, last time around, Brian Kemp only won his race by 1.4%, and he's not a very popular governor, and he's made a lot of enemies both in the Republican Party and in the Democratic Party. Um, you know, he could face several primary opponents, and he probably will. And Stacey Abrams might run for governor. So I think everything is going against Brian Kemp right now. Of course, the victory in the special elections for Democrats has been very encouraging for them. And I actually think this is going to be a surprising pickup in 2022. So I think uh, we're going to see the state of Georgia move significantly more to the left. And one of the reasons I say that 
is because you know Georgia has trended so rapidly to the to the left. If we look at uh, the suburban trends, massively, some of these counties going 15, 12, 9, 12, 14 points in favor of Joe Biden. And, and the, the larger arrows not only indicate a larger shift, but larger population areas. These are huge, uh, largely dense population areas. The small areas of the state aren't getting red at nearly the rate. In fact, some of them are going back to uh, the Democrats very slowly. Uh, not only that, but they're losing population. The population is exploding in the Atlanta metro area. So uh, I think that's going to be a pickup. Now, again, we're, you know, uh, over two years out. Uh, sorry, uh, we're about a year and a half out uh, from the 2022 midterms. And things could change. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised that the Georgia governor's race does actually end up switching parties, which would be uh, a big blow to the GOP because that would almost solidify the Democratic turn the state of Georgia has actually taken. So once that goes, the legislature will probably go in another four to six years, and then Georgia will probably remain a blue state and probably keep uh, trending blue, similar to like a Virginia. Uh, finally, we go to the state of Florida. Uh, this isn't a state we're going to talk very much, which is surprising because Florida is normally a very uh, close state. But I actually think Ron DeSantis is going to win very comfortably. I think he's going to win by a likely margin, which uh, by my ranking is anywhere from 7 to 12 points. Um, the latest polls I've seen, I don't really have them up here, but his net approval is I think around 12 points. And um, that's actually lower than when he actually took office where his approval was around 62%. I think now it's only like 52 or 54 but he has a very high approval rating. And in fact, he has a lot of room to improve in Miami-Dade and a lot of the counties where Trump uh, did super well in the presidential election. You know, Trump only lost Miami-Dade by eight points, which is astronomical uh, considering if you, you know, in the 2016 election, Trump uh, lost Miami-Dade by 30 points. So we go from 30 points to losing it by eight. That is a gigantic shift, uh, a gigantic shift in favor of the Republicans. And a lot of that has to do with the Cuban vote becoming more galvanized in favor of Donald Trump, higher turnout, and overall just Trump's better performance with Latino voters around the country. Um, you know, so as Miami-Dade uh, trended a lot redder, uh, Jacksonville trended a lot bluer. You know, it wouldn't, I'm not going to call this because I think it's a, would be a bit premature, but I would not be surprised if Miami-Dade actually were to actually flip in 2022, at least for Marco Rubio's race. Um, you know, the last time Marco Rubio ran for his Senate seat, he was running for re-election, and he won very comfortably. He won by uh, eight points uh, against a Democrat and won some safe margins in Duval County, Jacksonville. Uh, did much better in Miami-Dade, only losing it by 11. So Marco Rubio, this is going to be a safe Republican seat, I think, without a doubt, especially with him being the presumptive nominee, and I think he is running for re-election again. Anyway, this is my very premature 2022 gubernatorial prediction let me know what you guys think in the comments below and uh give me i guess video suggestions if you have any or what i should make in the future because this is kind of the off season it's very slow in terms of politics i have a few video ideas but you know with college and stuff i get uh i tend to postpone them until i really have time to put uh, effort into them uh, but anyway guys thank you all for watching uh please stay tuned and i hope to see you in the next one